had written history for 5,000 years, right? People have been generally literate for less than 500 years. But we've had culture for 150,000 years. Identifiable culture for at least 25,000. So the vast period of our enculturation was preliterate enculturation before we could write down the rules and transmit them. How were they transmitted, assuming we had culture? Well, there's a variety of mechanisms. We have a tendency to see elements of the world in personified form because most of the interrelationships we have with the world are actually social or interpersonal relationships. So that's basically how our brain is structured. And as we evolved, we developed the capacity to extend our cognitive ability beyond the merely social to take in the world as such. But the categories that we used to do that were still fundamentally social. Now the reason the unknown per se is symbolized as feminine is because the critical feature of the feminine, and I don't mean the female individual, I mean the feminine as a category, is its capacity to generate new forms. And the unknown as such is, is logically and appropriately symbolized by the feminine because it's the bringer forth of all things, which is to say that the background of existence, the unknowable background of existence is the thing that generates everything. Paired with that, of course, according to the schema that we've been working with, uh, is the archetype of the great father. And the archetype of the great father is the archetype of tradition, fundamentally. The great weight of the past. Because as you incorporate your past, the past of your culture, through the intermediation of your parents, you learn routines and rituals for structuring the unknown. Now, those routines and rituals are patterns of action that you use in the world as such, and also complex patterns of action that you use to structure your own interpretations and your own motor output and your own conceptualizations when you're dealing with other people. And so that would be the absorption fun most fundamentally of your cultural rules. And the fact of those cultural rules and their incarnation in you essentially keeps chaos at bay. Which means, if two of you share the same cultural structure, assuming you're playing the same game, so to speak, that means that you can each predict each other's responses, which is very, very useful, because that way you, you can be sure that you can trust the other person. You can more or less infer their goals, because after all, their value structure is similar to yours. And if you can infer their goals, that means you can embody their emotions. So that's the benevolent aspect of tradition, right? The part that protects and shelters you and structures the nature of your being in the face of, of existential terror and doubt, so to speak. But there's also an aspect of tradition that's terrible, uh, tyrannical. It's the part that marches young men off to war, say, in defense of the structures that it's protecting. It's the part that says, when you're a teenager, wear this and not this, or you'll be the target of mockery for all your peers. It's the part of the structure that crushes the creative life out of you because the tyrannical aspect of social order doesn't want your creative light, life, so to speak. What it wants is your obedience because your obedience is what makes the machine run smooth. And so you're always in an ambivalent relationship with regards to security, to authority. On the one hand, it provides you shelter and what you need and allows you to gain the benefits of literally thousands and thousands of years of cultural evolution. On the other hand, it's the thing that makes you obey or face the painful consequences thereof, which can range from you know, mere social exclusion and consequent re-exposure to the unknown to, to truly oppressive practices designed to make you be exactly like everyone else or else. And so you could say, most particularly, again, that that's a standard existential problem. It's a problem that's faced by people in every place and in every culture, balancing the appropriate attitude towards culture. So the most fundamental representation of culture can be portrayed essentially in this manner, I think. And uh, what you see here is the dragon of chaos, of course, lurking in the background. And what that means is that all forms come from the formless, and that the Father itself is a primary form, uh, a representation of God the Father. And God the Father in the Christian Trinity is the representation of the positive and the security inducing and the tyrannical aspect of social order, right? God has a set of rules for you. You bloody well better listen to those rules. If you don't, all hell's going to break loose. And 
you know, that is a pretty reasonable summary of how things work unfortunately. So, on the one hand God offers security, on the other, other hand he offers tyranny and in total that basically represents order. So, you can see this representation is quite useful, shows God uh, standing over this city, which of course is a city uh, uh, committed to him fundamentally. So, it operates under the moral principles that he represents and behind him is a representation of the sun, which is partly a representation of the source of all life, partly a representation of the source of consciousness and illumination, right, because you are conscious during the day and partly a, a halo representing the sort of transcendent nature of the, of the social order that stru structures existence. So, it is a primary phenomenon and it is only to say that in all human experience there is a cultural aspect and a natural aspect and the funny thing is the cultural aspect in some ways is as natural as the natural aspect right because we are social beings we cannot exist without society, society structures our very nature then we are beneficiaries and victims. And so then just as the case just as is the case with the uh, feminine, there is uh, two aspects that can be represented metaphorically with regards to the masculine. You can say, well, the secure aspect of social order is the wise king, and you can see a re medieval representation of him here sitting on his throne calmly in a relatively open posture. That means he's ready to listen to, supp to supplicants, to people who are coming to talk to him. He's holding an orb with a cross on top of it, which means essentially that he's in control of the world and that the world is subordinated to something else that's represented by the cross, a wise and just ruler. And then his mirror image here is the sun devouring king, a very common mythological theme, the father who wants to destroy his son. And there's shades of the Oedipal conflict in that, of course, if you remember your Freud. But basically what it means is this, is that despite the fact that every human being is an offspring of culture by nature, um, every human being is also in the terrible position of facing the fact that their very individuality is likely to be crushed out of them during, during the socialization process and that in a sense that is really, really not avoidable. I mean if you are subject to really tyrannical socialization it is obviously a much more cardinal problem, right? But even if you are subject to socialization under normal circumstances, you are still what you are rather than the manifold things that you could have otherwise been. And, and, and just to give you some sense of how dramatic a process this really is, one of the things you should know is that you actually die into your brain. So one of the things you might wonder is, why is, why is it that death evolved? It, it does not really make that much sense from a Darwinian perspective, right? Because you would make the presupposition that if you could just stick around and father children say for 250 years, you would be doing a lot better job than the poor sap who only lived to be 30. So why is it that you only live to be 70 and really your, you know, your period of fertility is over say by the time you are 40? Why would that be? What is the utility of death? And then you remember, well, the environment is always changing right in this chaotic manner that is represented by the great mother. Can you change with it? And the answer to that is yes, but only to a certain point, which is why as people age they, they tend to become more and more alienated from the current culture, right? They have adopted their position of being say, which is more or less fixed by the time they are 25 or so once their prefrontal cortex matures and then after that the world gets away from them. They do not have enough biological resources left to constantly undergo new revolutionary neurological processes and part of the reason is this. You have more neural connections in your brain when you are first born than you do for the rest of your life, any other time in your life. And as you learn when you are an infant and as you learn say over the first two years, what happens is that there is a plenitude of circuits and they die off leaving only those circuits that have a function and you think about that as kind of a quasi Darwinian process and so what that means is that as you mature and become fixed in your form you know to adopt your personality whatever it becomes what's happening is that the excess possibility in some sense is being demolished by experience so the tyrannical aspect of enculturation is something that's real because it makes you in large part what you are and you have to understand as well that that is necessary because it is better to be something in the final analysis, it is better to be something than to be nothing. But you know we still have residual 
dreams like those expressed by Peter Pan, say, who is the boy that never wants to grow up, because he doesn't want to attain any final and fixed form. And it's interesting, because in, in one respect, as you progress through your life, you are climbing, assuming things are going well, you are climbing to ever new heights, but on the other hand, the, the direction that you are going in constantly narrows as you age. So, there is a real trade-off there, and, and, and I think the existential angst that is caused as a consequence of that trade-off is, is often real. And I also think that adolescents and early adults feel this most intently, which is part of the reason why they tend to rebel against social structures in general, you know, the, whether it is the military industrial complex or the corporate world or globalization or what have you, is that you have these large structures that represent the tyrannical aspect of social being. And, and it is no wonder that the fact of those structures engenders rebellion. It should. On the other hand, it is also no wonder that structures like that exist, because if they didn't exist, then people would have no way of interrelating their, their social being. And we would revert back to the sort of Hobbesian state of war, where everybody's arms are around everybody else's throat. And that doesn't mean the payoff is always good. So, for the Freudians, of course, had a real field day with this, and, and were, were most fundamentally concerned by it. Now, part of the reason that Freudian psychology has had such an immense impact on Western and world culture is because Freud came along just when classical Judeo-Christian mythological structures were on, the, on a serious decline in the West. And Freud stepped in with a secularized mythological ver version of reality, which said, well, there is nature. And that's the id, right? That's the wild and untamed impulses that spring up from, from the animal mind. And there's the ego, which is the individual who's, who's in many ways a pawn of these id-like forces. And then on top of the ego, crushing it down into the id, so to speak, is the superego, which is the uh, internal and external embodiment of social order and morality. So you can see the mythological substructure underlying Freud. Freud said, well, the ego is always being shaped by the superego, and it's always compulsion. It's don't, don't. It's always no. It's like Old Testament morality, right? In the incarnation of the Ten Commandments. Whatever you want to do, if it feels good, the probability is high that it's immoral from the perspective of the social world. And you can really see this with children, you know. It, it's really remarkable to watch them because my sense is, and I, and I don't think this is just because I'm a particularly tyrannical father, is that children often get in more trouble for having fun than they do for any other reason, because their capacity for unbridled enjoyment is so unbridled that it actually poses a threat to orderly structures. So, you know, if a child really gets in an active mood and is playing a very active game, I mean, especially if they're somewhere between, say, three and five, they can tear your house to shreds in no time, no time flat, and you're always following them around going, no, 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 quiet down, don't do that. And you know, they're smiling away and they're happier than any adult you're ever going to see in your entire life, and you're doing everything you can to push them down so that they're, they can sit quietly and read a book or whatever it is you think they should be doing. And that's really nasty and horrible, but by the same token, it's absolutely necessary because if they don't learn to bring their impulses, even their impulses, their ludic impulses, right, their impulses to play under control, then nobody else can stand them. And if they don't get access to the resources that are in the social world, man, they have one dismal life laid out in front of them. So, anyway, so that's an early description of the genesis of the conflict, say, between the ego and the superego. And I just wanted to point that out because it's not just sex and aggression that gets regulated, right? I mean, we can understand why that might happen. But it's also playfulness and creativity and spontaneity and all the things that we associated with the joy of being that the terrible, tyrannical social structure puts a clamp on. So Jack Panksepp, for example, has recently demonstrated that children, boys, because it's usually boys, who have attention deficit disorder, which is generally diagnosed in the schoolroom, do much better if they're placed on methylphenidate, which is a kind of uh, amphetamine, fundamentally, but normal kids do better on amphetamines too, by the way. They can focus better, they can focus more, and they can pay attention more. Mostly what methylphenidate does is suppress play. So, Panksepp's notion is that, well, what's happening with these ADHD kids, hyperactive kids, is they're more playful, more, more boisterously playful, which is, tends to be a masculine attribute in, in the juvenile forms of many mammals, they're boisterously playful, give them a little meth methylphenidate, that shuts down their play behavior and they can sit down and focus, you know. And Well, you can understand how even if you might think that's necessary, because apparently many people do, you can also still understand that 
by the same token, that probably represents some kind of loss, right? Because we like to see kids play and it's good for them besides. So, anyways, Freud says, the ego pops up, it's all thrilled to death with the world, the superego comes along and shuts it down, and that's a fate that befalls all of us. And not only that, because Freud's a pretty wise man, all things considered, he doesn't say, that's all to the bad, he says, that's the price we pay for social being, and fair enough. You see this happening in children all the time, where part of what they do as they mature is to adopt roles, so they'll play being a father or being a mother, say, and what they're doing is pulling in what they see as, a, as the world view that characterizes parenthood, embodying the father, playing out the role, and trying to organize their motivational structures within the observed framework, say, that the father provides. And that's an interjection of social wisdom. If, if you can imagine that the role of father, say, has a structure, like one structure would be, well, if you're a father and you're around to model, then you have to be taking care of the children, or at least you have to be there often enough so that you can be a target of modeling. And so you can imagine that the spirit of the father that's modeled, at least in the optimal circumstances, is one that deals out rules and order, but that also provides nurturing care and support. And that's a kind of story. We know fathers who aren't like that. And maybe we know fathers who are too much like that. But all things considered, on the average, you have a father role, and children attempt to interject that. And that's part of the way that they learn to modulate their own motivational resources. So, for example, if the child observes the father and the mother sharing, which means taking each other's motivational states into account, then they can act out the game of sharing with a doll, say, representing a child. And what they're doing is trying to imagine what it's like inside that doll's head, treating it like a person, by embodying the potential motivations and emotional states of that pretend object in their own body, and then by trying to organize a higher order structure, which would be like the tea party where tea is shared, a higher order structure where you have a turn, because you want a turn because you're thirsty like me, and then I have a turn and we both get what we want and we can exchange information and, well, that's a little bit more optimistic representation of the tyranny of social order than pure compulsion, right? Because what it suggests is there's a way that you can organize the way you are, genuinely, and the way I am, genuinely, so that we both are genuine, yet we get something more than we would get if we were just by ourselves. And so you think that with kids. They like to play by themselves, but by the time they're about three and a half or four, boy, like they have a hunger for other children. And they'll do anything in order to go out and play with other kids. So you can say to them, well, if you, if you take all the toys off your bed, I'll go and let you play with your friend. And like the toys are off there in two tenths of a second and they're out the door because they have this primary need to go out and experiment with the social world. And in large, way, in large part, that's how they build the complex, higher order, more abstract structures that enable them to regulate their, motiva their motivational states and their emotional states without just no. It's, it's a more sophisticated way of doing it, right? It's better to play a game with someone than to engage in a battle of wills with them. Because then there's no compulsion, there's just mutual participation. And, and that's critical, because one of the things that the notion of the tyranny of the social order brings up as a question is, all right, all right, so you have to take part in society, right? You have to take your part in the social world. Yet, the social world wants its pound of flesh or its 60 pounds of flesh, depending on where you live. On the one, so you're damned if you do, so to speak, and you're damned if you don't. What do you do as a consequence of facing that challenge? And so you remember with the great mother, with chaos and the unknown, the way you meet the challenge is to understand that the things you don't understand are dangerous and frightening, and that if you encounter them, they can hurt you, and that this is real. But you don't run away all the same, right? If you're trying to get somewhere and things you don't understand happen, you can't shut yourself down. You have to explore cautiously and try to gain new knowledge. Well, how do you organize your social being? Well, let's make the presupposition that you've got half a dozen or so fundamental motivational states, right? So what they are is your subjugation to a world of a priori deities, right? You see in children, rage, fear, hunger, anger, affiliation, love, the capacity to play, all value sets 
which have their own goal-like behavioral patterns, their own worldview, their own way of manifesting themselves, all those are innate, right? They're all dependent on pre-wired neural architectural systems. They have to unfold in experience, but they're there. Okay, and so let's say that's what you come into the world with, and that's what you come into the world with, and that's what you come into the world with. But then the fact that you're in the world poses a more complex problem, which is, well, yeah, you've got one motivational state happening, you're angry. But then you've got another one you have to worry about, which is you'd like to be affiliated with someone, like your sibling. So you've got a real conflict with your sibling. It's like you really hate them, but you really like them too, and you want to play with them. So what do you do about that? Well, you'd say a behaviorally dysregulated child who isn't well socialized, say they're impulsive. They don't, they don't act as if they take the future into account, so they heavily future discount. They're impulsive. What does that mean? If you watch a child have a temper tantrum, which around two they're really prone to, it's like, it's a phenomena, you know, it's like a tornado on a real small scale. The child's just flipped out. If you saw an adult do that, you'd run away screaming, right? And they're completely dominated by this emotional state. And my sense watching that has always been to kind of try to help the kid not have that happen to them because it looks like a terrible catastrophe for their emerging ego, right? I mean, they're trying to get their world together and something frustrates them and whomp, up come these like amygdalic projections that are governing anger, hypothalamic, even more primitive, and just like bowl them over and then they're on the floor and they're holding their breath and they're turning blue and they're having a fit and then it takes them like 15 minutes to recover. So they have to take themselves into account as total, as complete beings. And that's the emergence of a higher order morality. But it's more complicated than that because not only do they have the problem of themselves, which is a bad enough problem, but then they have the problem of the other person. So what's the proper response of the individual given that he or she is threatened by the natural world and the unknown on the left hand and threatened by the social order and its tyranny on the right hand, but also dependent on the natural world and chaos for all good things and all new information and dependent on the social order for their very mode of being, right? Caught between four paradoxes all at the same time. How can that route be properly negotiated? Well, and then you can look at hero mythology and the most common plot, and I would say in some ways the only plot although there are variations of this that are endless, romantic variations or adventure story variations or variations of failed heroic endeavor, still the only plot goes something like this. There's a current state of being. Now that can be represented by a psychological state, your current personality. It can be represented by your family. It can be re represented by your extended social group, your city, your town, your country, your ecosystem. Your, 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 in science fiction frequently, the entire global community, right? A structure is threatened. By what? Well, you name it. If it's dangerous, it can threaten the structure. That can be one of various forms of barbarian, right? Any person from another culture, an alien in science fiction, uh, a terrible monster that lives in the deep that had been dominated and oppressed before but has come back for more, uh, an agent of horror, that's a common theme in modern horror movies, right? An object that moves, the ghosts in the basement because the dead were improperly buried, etc., etc., etc. Anything uncanny, anything fear-inspiring, anything reptilian, um, anything that smothers or in entrances or seduces or you name it. If it's change, or some metaphoric representation of anything that can change, then it's this, the dragon of chaos. And that's the thing that always threatens the stable state in its multiple potential manifest forms. And what does that mean? It means the apocalypse is always happening, right? The end of the world is always before us, which is why you see apocalyptic imagery, for example, throughout the New Testament, Christ says, the world is coming to an end, and people are waiting around for it to happen, but what they don't precisely understand is that the world is always coming to an end. Always. And that's because what you think now is not good enough for the next second. Right? You have to change, because change is coming. And what change means is you have to let go of what you know. That's the apocalypse, and it's always on us. The structure is threatened. 
Well, what do you do about that? Well, you can run, but you can't hide, right? That's the theory, and the reason for that is that even if you are unwilling to face the threat that's right in front of you, no matter where you run to, that threat's going to be there. So you see, in the case of an agoraphobic woman, who starts to run away from the shopping mall when she has heart palpitations, that then she runs away from the subway, and then she runs away from taxis, and then buses, and then other people, and then finally she's at home, and there's nowhere to run, but her heart's still palpitating, and the fear of death is still on her, and there's no place to go. So, hiding isn't much of a help. Or you can pretend that the chaotic thing isn't there, and refuse to change. But all that does is make the threat bigger, and bigger, and bigger, and bigger. So, just like, simply put, well, say you only have $100 in the bank, and you have a $110 telephone bill, and you think, well, I, I'd like that $100, I'm not going to pay that telephone bill. It's just a little threat, right? But then you don't pay it, and the next month it's a $125 telephone bill, and then they slap a $50 charge on you, and then they cut off your phone, so then you don't have a phone, then you miss a job appointment, and that's not so good, and then it's $250 to pay your phone bill and another $200 to get it hooked back up. And then your credit record goes all to hell because you haven't paid any of that, and then you can't buy a house when you're 25. And you think, kind of weird, eh? Little bitty chaos turns into a great big monster. And partly that's because everything that looks separate from everything else isn't. It just looks that way. And when you ignore anything, especially if it's impeding your progress, you know it's impeding your progress, you know you have to deal with it, step away from it and see what its true nature really is. So you can hide, and you can not change, or you can pretend that the threat doesn't exist, but in the final analysis that just stores up the catastrophe for later.